Um, I've been studying the lives of Jesus and Muhammad on and off since 1994, first as an atheist and later as a Christian. I don't think that anyone can really understand the world around us without uh, understanding uh, the messages of Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, so I look forward to our exchange tonight. Uh, Sammy and I are going to be disagreeing uh, a lot tonight, but I, I do want to just uh, acknowledge here at the beginning that uh, Christians and Muslims do agree on a number of issues. We agree that there is one God, uh, all-knowing, all-powerful, infinite, uh, perfect, and good. We agree um, that God has sent messengers into the world, that God created the world, that God will ultimately judge the world. Concerning Jesus, we agree that he was born of a virgin. And it's important to keep, th keep these things in mind. Who agrees with Christians that Jesus was born of a virgin? Yes. It's Muslims, right? Um, we agree that uh, Jesus performed all kinds of miracles, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus spoke the truth. We agree uh, on a lot of things. Uh, and so we have to keep these things in mind, uh, but for now, uh, we do have some differences. And uh, Sammy's the one saying, hey, we agree on everything, and uh, you know, most things. I, 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 I have to be the bad guy here and say uh, we disagree on a lot of things, and there are some important reasons. And the, the issues we normally disagree on concern some, some issues with the nature of God, the identity of Jesus, the way to salvation, and some issues about how we are to live our life. Now, where do these differences uh, really come from? Why is it that a Christian uh, certainly believes different things from a Muslim? And I would say it's actually uh, very simple. This is, uh, this is a Bible, this is a Quran, and if you open them up and start reading, uh, you get some similarities, but you also get some important uh, differences in the messages in these two books. And so one of the important things that's going to come up is how we uh, try to reconcile them. Sammy goes to the Bible and, and tries to harmonize it with the teachings of the Quran, and um, that certainly works with some teachings of the Bible, uh, but we're going to look at a few more things. Uh, so let's look at some of the things Jesus says in the Gospel, and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just read some passages for you. Uh, in Mark 9.31, Jesus tells his disciples, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Uh, so Jesus says he's going to be killed, and that he's going to rise again after he's been killed. Uh, but according to Islam, Jesus never died, and therefore didn't rise from the dead. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 10.45, Sammy doesn't think this is a very important uh, part of Jesus' message, but Jesus says in uh, Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says that he has come to, to give his life as a ransom for others. So this is, these are not my words, these are Jesus' words. Uh, Jesus claims that he's going to lay down his life as a ransom for others. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. In this single, in this single verse, Jesus claims that he owns everything, all things have been handed over to him, that he is the divine Son of God, that the Father is the only one who truly knows him, and that people can only know the Father through Him. Uh, not the sort of thing we would expect Jesus to say, given what we read about Him in the Quran, given what Sammy quoted to us from the Quran. In John 17, 5, Jesus claims that He existed with the Father before the world was created. He said, Now, Father, glorify Me together with Yourself, with the glory which I had with You before the world was. After his resurrection from the dead, Jesus did receive this glory that he had before creation. We read in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, this is after he rose from the dead. Uh, the passage reads, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now think about what you have in this passage. Jesus says that he has all authority, not only on earth, all authority in heaven and on earth. His followers, his followers are to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says he's going to be with his followers wherever they are, even to the end of the age. This doesn't sound like a mere prophet to me. As far as future events are concerned, in John 5, 25 to 29, Jesus says that at the resurrection, the dead are going to rise when they hear his voice. Listen to his words. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Not only is Jesus going to raise the dead for their final judgment, he's also going to be the one who judges them. That's what he claims. In Matthew 25, 31 to 32, Jesus says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the, sh as the shepherd separates, them, uh, separates the sheep from the goats. He goes on in that passage to say that he's the one who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Uh, what mere prophet could ever claim that after he speaks and raises the dead, he gets to judge uh, judge people and decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Uh, these are the sorts of things we read about Jesus in the gospel. The, design, the, the divine son lays aside his glory that he had from all eternity. He enters the world to die as a ransom for sins. After he dies, he rises from the dead, gets that glory back, and will eventually uh, resurrect and judge all of us. Yes, Jesus said lots of other things, things that Sammy pointed out, but this is the message of Jesus, and we can't kind of pick and choose here what we like to believe. Now, nearly six centuries after Jesus made these claims, uh, Muhammad came along and preached uh, a, a message that was similar in certain ways and very different in other ways. Uh, I agree with, with Sammy that um, kind of the overall message of Islam uh, is fairly easy to understand. I would, I would summarize the message of Islam uh, in kind of two steps. One, you need to submit to God. I would agree with that step. You need to submit to God. That's sort of part one. Uh, part two, the rest of the message, is how you do that. So how do I submit to, to God? How do I submit to Allah? And here's where you have uh, the teachings of uh, the Quran and the Hadith. You submit to Allah by obeying uh, Allah's commands in the Quran and Muhammad's commands in the Hadith. Um, but it's, uh, the Quran puts a lot of emphasis on just how diligent you have to be in obeying uh, Muhammad. According to the Quran, you can't have any faith unless you uh, completely accept Muhammad's decisions. Uh, in Surah 4, verse 65, Allah tells people they can have no faith until they make Muhammad the judge in their disputes and do not resist, have no resistance to Muhammad's decisions. So Surah 4, verse 65 reads, But know, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. So... Part of submitting, part of having that full submission, is making Muhammad the judge in all disputes. Uh, part of submitting to Allah is submitting fully to Muhammad. In Surah 33, 36, Allah says that when Allah and Muhammad have made a decision 
uh, the believer has no option about that decision. So here we read, it is not fitting for a believer, man or woman, when a matter has been decided by Allah and his apostle to have any option about their decision. If anyone disobeys Allah and his apostle, he is indeed on a clearly wrong path. So you submit to Allah, not only by believing in the six articles of faith, not only by uh, performing the five pillars, but by opening the Quran and the Hadith and believing the things that you're required to believe and uh, doing the things you're required to do without resistance and without objection. But now we have a problem. Part of Muhammad's message, part of the things that you are required to believe as a Muslim without objecting, is that Jesus spoke the truth, that Jesus is a true messenger. And what I mean here is, if I go to an atheist and I say, hey, atheist, Jesus said this, the atheist can say, I don't care. Who's he? Uh, but a Muslim and a Christian aren't allowed to say that sort of thing. We both agree whatever Jesus said, we have to, uh, we have to pay attention to that. Um, but as we've seen, the teachings of Jesus don't line up with the teachings of Muhammad on uh, several <coughs> very important issues. Uh, Jesus claimed to be the divine son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead. Muhammad denied all of this. Uh, now think about this. Muhammad says, believe what Jesus said, and then contradicts what we read about what Jesus said. Uh, I only have two options here. I can either believe what Jesus said or I can uh, not believe what Jesus said. Right? Those are my two options. I can believe what Jesus said, or I cannot believe what Jesus said. Those are my choices. If I believe what Jesus said, about being the divine Son of God who dies on the cross and rises from the dead, if I believe what Jesus said, then I have to reject Muhammad because Muhammad said those things aren't true. So if I look at what Jesus said and I said, I believe that, then I have to reject what Muhammad taught because Muhammad taught something totally different. If, on the other hand, I say, well, I don't believe what Jesus said, I'm rejecting those claims by Jesus, then I also have to reject what Muhammad said because he told me to believe what Jesus said. In other words, if I accept what Jesus said, I have to reject what Muhammad taught, and if I don't believe what Jesus said, I have to reject what Muhammad taught. Either way, no matter what I do here, I have to reject what Muhammad taught. Uh, for me then, the main issue of our debate tonight is how we resolve the fact that Jesus and Muhammad taught radically different things. For the Christian, the solution is pretty simple. Thousands of people down through the ages have claimed to speak for God, have claimed to give us the truth about God. They can't all be right because lots of their messages contradict each other. If I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm going to listen to the one who rose from the dead. I mean, if anyone in history has God's stamp of approval on his message, I would say it's the one who rose from the dead. And so if I open up the teachings of the one who rose from the dead, and Muhammad comes along later and teaches something else, I have to say, I'm sorry, you're not the one who rose from the dead, I, I, and you contradict him, so I can't, uh, I can't accept what you're saying. Uh, but Muslims are going to take a different approach. Muslims are required to believe in both Jesus and Muhammad. So when Muhammad, uh, I mean, when Muslims open the Bible and find Jesus claiming that he has all authority in heaven and on earth and that he's the final judge of all people and that he's the one who will raise the dead at the resurrection. When Muslims read these things, they usually say corruption. The Bible's been corrupted. Um, those things were made up. Jesus never actually said them, so the dispute uh, evaporates. Uh, the problem with this response is that the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Gospel. The Quran affirms the inspiration of the Gospel, for instance, in Surah 3, 3 through 4. He has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it, and he revealed the Torah and the Gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Quran. So Allah revealed the Gospel as a guidance for mankind. What happened then? Did man corrupt it? Uh, not according to the Quran, he didn't. The Quran says that Christians still had the gospel in Muhammad's time. In Surah 7, 157, we read, 
Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. How do we find Muhammad in the gospel if we don't have the gospel? Uh, interestingly, when Muhammad was apparently having some doubts about his revelations, he was commanded to go to the people of the book for confirmation. Allah tells Muhammad in Surah 1094, but if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Mm -hmm. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. How is Muhammad going to check with the people of the book, people who've been reading the book, it says, if people don't have the book? Contrary to charges of corruption, uh, the Quran claims that no one, no one can corrupt Allah's word. This is Surah 18, verse 27. And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. There is none who can alter his words. Who can corrupt Allah's words according to the Quran? The position of the Quran is you're not powerful enough. You can't do that. You can't stop Allah. There are certain times when I read the Quran, I'm like, wow, that's good theology. It's good theology. What human being can get in Allah's way? Uh, not surprisingly, as far as the Quran is concerned, the Gospel is still authoritative scripture. Surah 5, verse 47, commands, it's a command to Christians. Let the people of the Gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. That's interesting because lots of people say, don't go to the gospel, it's been corrupted. Allah says, go to the gospel or you're in rebellion against me. Judge by the gospel or you are a rebel. How can I judge by the gospel if I don't have the gospel or the gospel is uh, hopelessly corrupted and unreliable? <laughs> we find the same thing in Surah 5, verse 68. Say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the law, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. I have no ground to stand upon if I do not stand upon the gospel. How can I stand upon the gospel if it's been corrupted, if I don't have it, if it's gone? Is Allah telling me to do something I can't possibly do here? The only conclusion to draw is that I'm supposed to stand upon the gospel, that I'm supposed to judge by the gospel. So the Quran affirms the inspiration, the thing was revealed by Allah, the gospel was revealed by Allah, the preservation, no one can alter his words, and the authority of the gospel, that the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. But here we find the same problem that arose earlier. There are only two possibilities. Either the gospel, either either what I have is the word of God or it's not. It's either the uncorrupted word of God or it's not. It's one or the other. If I have the uncorrupted word of God, I have to reject Muhammad's message because, as we've seen, Muhammad's message contradicts what I read here. So if this is the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad's message. Alternatively, if this isn't the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad's message because he said it was. So if this is the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad. If it's not the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad. Either way, I have to reject Muhammad. And therefore, I have to reject Muhammad. So this is where I find myself in examining uh, the message of Jesus and the message of Muhammad. <coughs> Jesus presented a message. Some people don't like it. Some people don't. <coughs> But at the end of the day, I have to say, he's the one who rose from the dead, I'm going to believe in him. Whatever he says, I'm going to believe. And then I turn to Islam, which denies many of the doctrines preached by the man who rose from the dead. And I have to say, well, who's right here? Who's right? But then I turn to the message of Muhammad, and I find him affirming, affirming the inspiration, preservation, authority of the scriptures that tell me what Jesus taught. And so the message of Islam self-destructs in an important way by affirming scriptures that it contradicts. And so if I have to choose, I have to go with the message of Jesus. Um, Sammy says that 
Uh, the Quran does affirm the Gospel, but nowhere does it affirm the four Gospels or the writings of Paul. It affirms the original revelations given to Moses and to Jesus. Um, the Gospel is exactly how the four Gospels were referred to during the time of Muhammad. This goes back to Ignatius in 115, where the four Gospels were from then on treated as a lump. It was, they weren't called, we call them today the four, the four Gospels. Back then they were called the fourfold Gospel. That's how it was referred to from the second century on, to, on through the time of Muhammad. So when you said the Gospel to a Christian, that's what the Gospel was. That's what the Gospel was. So why would Allah tell Christians to judge by the Gospel, knowing how we're going to interpret that, knowing what that means to a Christian, right? This would be like, uh, suppose a prophet came along and said, you Muslims, judge by the Quran. And then walks away and says, by, by the way, I, when I say Quran, I mean something totally different than anything you're ever, you've ever seen. It wouldn't make any sense. You'd say, you need to be a little more clear. Uh, similarly, if God is coming to Christians saying, you judge by the gospel, well, that, that means something to a Christian. That means the gospel that we have. That means the fourfold gospel. And that's exactly what I've done in this debate. I judge the claims of Muhammad by the claims in the gospel. He says, well, we don't have the original manuscripts of the gospel. Well, true, we don't have the original manuscripts uh, of the Quran. What's the point? The question is whether it's been preserved accurately. <laughs> now, if we're talking about the Quran, according to Muslim sources, there are all kinds of changes in the Quran. Entire chapters were lost. Large sections were lost. Individual verses were lost. There were a couple of verses. Aisha had the only copy, and she says her sheep came and ate them. The verse of stoning and the verse of breastfeeding an adult ten times. They're supposed to be in the Quran. They're not there. Where'd they go? Aisha, said, Aisha says her sheep ate them. With that, with that, I will say, I wouldn't say that the Quran has been corrupted. Right? I think some things, some things were, uh, were, were deleted along the way. I wouldn't say corrupted. Why? Because I believe that the, the message has been preserved. The message of the Quran has been preserved. And that's exactly what I always say about the Bible. Yes, you have textual variants, you have scribes making mistakes and so on, but you can compare manuscripts. We have around 6,000 Greek manuscripts. You can compare them, and when someone makes a mistake, you can generally spot it. And so obviously, I would say, the message of the Bible has not been corrupted. So we have to be uh, fair in our standards here. If you're going to say we don't have the original manuscripts, therefore it's a problem, well, then we've got a problem with Islam, and we have another reason to reject Muhammad's message. Sammy says that when the Quran tells people to judge by the Torah or the Gospel, um, we have examples of this in the Muslim sources. And I think this is, a, this is a huge point, but this doesn't go in Sammy's favor. The story that he referred to about the, the, the issue of adultery, in that story, Muhammad says, bring me a copy of the Torah. And when they bring out the Torah, Muhammad says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. He's talking to the Torah that was brought out, the actual copy that was brought out by the Jews. He said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Wait a minute, I thought the scriptures had been corrupted. What's he doing talking to an actual manuscript saying he believes in it? This only makes sense if this was the actual, uh, the actual Torah. And this fits in with what we know, um, with what we know from the Quran. Um, Sammy says that the Quran is using rhetorical devices when, he, when it says, uh, why are you coming to Muhammad when you have your own book? Uh, this is a very important passage. I, I invite uh, everyone to read it. It's Surah 5, verses 43 through 48. And what you find there, you don't find rhetorical devices. The Jews come to Muhammad to judge a dispute, and the Quran's response is, why are you coming to Muhammad when you have the Torah? And then it goes down to verse 47, and it says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If you fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, you're no better than those who rebel. Is it a rhetorical device to say, you Christians had better judge by the gospel, or you are a rebel? That's not just a, that's not a rhetorical device. It's telling me I'm in trouble if I don't judge by the gospel. That's what I'm doing tonight. And by the way, the next verse, that's where it says that Muslims judge by the Quran. So the picture you find here is, Jews, they have their Torah. It's inspired. It's preserved. It's authoritative. The Christians have their scripture, the gospel, and the Muslims have the Quran. And so everyone needs to judge by their scriptures. Well, I'm a Christian, so I'm commanded to judge by the gospel. And by the way, if it's just, I mean, if this is just a rhetorical device of some kind, think about the other verse I quoted. You have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Torah and the gospel. That sounds like, I mean, a, a serious threat to me. If I don't judge by the gospel, it doesn't sound like Allah is playing with words or something. Uh, Sammy says that Ibn, Ibn Abbas uh, said that Umar said that the Bible has been corrupted. 
Well, that's a problem for Umar. He contradicts what the Quran says very clearly, um, that no one can corrupt Allah's word, and that the gospel is still authoritative. Eventually, Muslims did look into what the Bible actually says, and many of them concluded, well, this must have been corrupted, but that's not the position of Muhammad himself. Um, Sami says, well, it, it just means Allah's original word. It's the original. Well, if it's only the original, and what we have today is different from the original, then Allah's word has been corrupted. The Quran says no one can corrupt Allah's word. So is the Quran wrong there? If it's been corrupted, if it's the only original, then I don't have it now. How can I judge by it? How can I stand upon it? I have no ground to stand upon unless I stand upon it, and I'm a rebel if I don't judge by it. How can I do that if it's the original that's now lost? Semi says, Surah 2 accuses people of writing their own books. Indeed, it does. And he's right. That did happen. That happened uh, in Judaism. It was collected into books that were uh, part of the, the Talmud and so on. Uh, it happened among Christians, uh, Muslims, came up with fabricated hadith. People can always, always, always invent false stories. The claim of the Quran is the Torah cannot, itself cannot be corrupted. The gospel cannot be corrupted. The Quran cannot be corrupted. And they all are all authoritative according to Islam. Uh, Sammy says that Jesus never said he would die by crucifixion. This was an interpolation. So the gospel has been corrupted, right? Jesus never said he was going to die by crucifixion. Never said he was going to die by crucifixion. Someone else wrote that later. And that's essential to the gospel. If you look at the book of Acts, that was part of the, the, the core message of Christianity. Jesus died on the cross for his sins. If that never happened, then the entire gospel message has been corrupted. And the Quran would be wrong when it says no one can corrupt the gospel. Um, as far as this being interpolated, think about it. From an Islamic perspective, why was it ever written back into the Bible, according to an Islamic perspective? Why would it have been written in the Bible that Jesus died on the cross? Where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died on the cross, according to Islam? According to Islam, Christians got the idea that Jesus died on the cross from Allah. Surah 4, 157. They said they killed the Messiah, but they didn't kill him. It was made to appear to them that way. It was made to appear to them that way. So according to the standard Muslim interpretation, who was actually crucified, Judas. Allah took Judas, disguised him, made him look like Jesus. Then Judas was put on the cross. Judas was crucified, but everyone thought that it was Jesus. So Jesus' followers eventually come to conclude that Jesus died on the cross. Why? Because Allah tricked them. So the reason, according to Sammy's perspective, the reason we open the Bible and find that Jesus died on the cross is that Allah tricked his followers into believing he died on the cross, and then they believed it and wrote it back into the gospel, which can't be corrupted. So I'm seeing some problems here. Uh, Sammy said, uh, with the claim that, that Jesus will judge the people, Sammy says, well, if Jesus is God because he judges, then the disciples will judge, uh, uh, will be gods as well, because they are going to judge. We have to clarify two different kinds of judgment here. There are judges all over London. There are judges all over the UK. There are all kinds of judges. It's not the kind of judgment we're talking about when someone says, I'm the one who stands at the judgment on the throne and decides who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That is a specific kind of judgment, which, according to the Quran and the Bible, is something only God does. Jesus says he's the one who's going to do it. That's not the same thing. Um, as far as Jesus saying... Uh, that he will be with his people for all times. Sammy says, well, this just means his teachings will be with them. Well, Jesus was a very bad communicator, according to Sammy, then, because no one walked away with that. No one walked away, oh, he's just saying his teachings will be with them. This is right after he says he has all authority on earth and in heaven, and that Christians have to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says he's going to be with his, with his followers forever. If, if, if he, Jesus didn't mean any of that, if all of that meant something else, Jesus... Uh, should not be exalted by anyone. We should say, wow, this guy is the worst, most unclear speaker in history. Don't believe anything he says because he didn't know how to communicate. Uh, Sammy says, when it comes to religious matters, yes, people must submit to Allah, to Muhammad's decisions. And now we're getting down to the, to the reason I, I uh, brought all this up. What the Quran says, that's a religious matter. Muhammad, uh, Muhammad says, got to submit to that. The Quran says, have to submit to that. Well, the Quran says... God revealed the gospel as a guidance for man, that no one can corrupt Allah's word, that Christians have no ground to stand upon if we don't stand upon the gospel. I open up the gospel, it doesn't line up with Islam. So if I obey the Quran's command to believe the gospel, I have to reject Islam. 
And so again, I'm confronted with the decision. I can either believe the one who rose from the dead, or I can believe the message that self-destructs upon uh, this kind of examination. Thanks again, Sammy. Um, Sammy says that when the Quran says the gospel, it's referring to the original gospel, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That would be perfectly fine if the only passage of the Quran I brought up is there are three, three through four, which says that the gospel was given as a revelation from God. Now, is that the only passage I brought up? According to Sammy's position, it seems, there was an original gospel, but now we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and we don't have that original gospel anymore. So the gospel has been corrupted into what we have now. This is what Christians mean when we say gospel. And so the word of God has been corrupted, contrary to Surah 1827 and Surah 6, 114 to 115, both of which declare no one can alter Allah's words. So the Quran is wrong, right? The Quran says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. Did Allah know that the gospel was gone, that it had been lost, that the original was lost, and that now when Christians hear, judged by the gospel, they're going to think, hey, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did Allah know that? I, I would say, of course, God would know that. God would know that sort of thing. God would know that, hey, if I'm going to tell these people to judge by the gospel, they're going to think I mean the gospel, not something else that no one has access to anymore that's been gone for six centuries. They're, they're, they're not going to get that. So, if, if, I mean, if I were writing this, I would say, hey, let me make this kind of clear here. When I say gospel, I'm referring to the original. You don't have it anymore, so don't judge by it. What you have now is not the word of God. Why would Allah, who knows that the gospel is gone and that Christians now have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why would Allah go to them and say, you have no ground to stand upon if you don't stand upon the Torah and the gospel? Why would he say that? It's just going to confuse us. Here it is 14 centuries later. I still can't get my mind around this. Judge by the gospel. You have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the gospel. According to Sammy, there's no way I can stand upon the Torah and the gospel because I don't have them. They've been corrupted. And there's no way I can judge by the gospel. I don't have it. And when I try to judge by it, it's the wrong book. It's the wrong book. Sammy says, uh, no one says that the entire Torah is corrupt. So it's no problem that Muhammad said to a copy of the Torah, I believe in you and the one who revealed you. Really. It's a corrupt book with some truth in it. And Muhammad can swear that it's the word of God. I mean, I believe that there is some truth in the Quran. It would never cross my mind to swear, I believe in the one who revealed you and in you. I believe in this book because I believe there are some things in it that are true. But according to Sammy, that's exactly what Muhammad did. He knows the Torah has been corrupted, and he swears that it's the word of God because there's some truth still in it, or even a lot of truth still in it. Muhammad is being very confusing to people like me. Right? He's saying, I believe that's the word of God even though he knows it's been corrupted, and he doesn't bother to say it's been corrupted. Sammy says that um, Muslims transmitted the Quran by oral tradition. And so it's very different from Christians who uh, transmitted the Gospels. Well, yeah, Christians use oral tradition too. It's eventually compiled uh, into the four Gospels were written. As far as not having the early manuscripts, um, you don't have the original oral transmission either. Right? And if you look at the, again, if you look at the history of the Quran, Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from four people. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is first on his list. How many chapters of the Quran did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud have in his Quran? 111. How many do you have in your Quran? 114. According to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 aren't supposed to be in the Quran. These were early prayers of Muslims. Now you can say he got it wrong, but Muhammad said, if you want to learn it from anyone, learn it from him. And he said the Quran you have today is wrong. Another person on that list of four was Ubay ibn Kaab. Ubay ibn Kaab had 116 chapters in his Quran. You have 114. He had all the chapters you have and two additional ones. So there is this early confusion. They didn't agree. And there were tons of manuscript differences. And yet, even today, I would not say the Quran has been corrupted. Why? Because I believe the message of Islam is really there. The message taught by Muhammad is really there. I believe it's there. So I wouldn't say it's been corrupted, even though you have these, these issues. But... I have to say, I think it's really hypocritical to say, well, you don't have the original manuscript of the Bible, therefore you just can't trust anything that's written. If that's the case, I have to reject Islam as well. And so if we're going to apply a consistent standard here, 
we have to say, all right, uh, according to the Quran, no one can corrupt Allah's word. Allah's word is the gospel. Doesn't make sense to say, well, it was at one time, but now it's been corrupted. No one can corrupt Allah's word. And so again, if I take this book seriously, I have to believe in Jesus. And if I take Jesus seriously, I can't believe this book. Okay, we come to 